Put 10 on your way out, and we'll have that gift for you. If you're watching online, if you would just post uh, the town or the city that you're watching from, uh, we would appreciate that so that we know who's watching with us today, because unfortunately, otherwise, we don't know. <laughs> we just see a number that says this number is watching, but we don't know who that is. We can't pray for you. We can't be in touch with you. So if you can comment where you're watching from, that would help us. All right? So disciples of Jesus care about the disadvantaged and those in need. In other words, disciples serve out in the community and try to help people. So one of the funniest serving events that we ever did, uh, I'm a member of the Reynoldsburg Lions Club, and one of the events that we have helped with is the Tomato Festival here in Reynoldsburg. And one year they had these inflatables, all different kinds of inflatables, and one of them was really strange, to say the least. So it was a caterpillar, and if you didn't, there were two ends uh, that people could go in and then go out of, and if, if you kept that open too long, it would start to sink. And it was super awkward because the, they climbed in through the rear. <laughs> this, this bottom left with the red, and it was really awkward because they couldn't just make their way into it themselves, the kids. It was too tough. And so we had to hold open the rear so that they could climb through. And the same thing on the way out through the front of it, we had to hold open the front. And it looked like we were helping this caterpillar give birth. That's what it looked like. like come on out, baby. It was super awkward. We had adults walking by, teenagers. They would look at that thing. They go, oh, that ain't right. And, uh, yeah, we know. We are never having this thing out here again. We said no to the caterpillar inflatable. Never again. You just never know what you're going to encounter when you're serving out in the community. You really don't. So we are learning how to be disciples. Now, test question. How many of you who were here last week uh, and you heard the sermon on, you know, are you a Christian or a disciple? Do you remember what the term disciple means? Or what's another word for disciples? Does anybody remember? Starts with an A. Giving you a hint. If you're learning an how to be an electrician, you start out as a beginner. Apprentice. apprentice. There you go. There you go. Now it's clicking. Cool. So if you are a disciple, that means you're an apprentice of Jesus. You're apprenticing under Jesus to learn how to be like him, and how to do what Jesus did, right? Well, guess what? One of the things that Jesus did was he cared about the disadvantaged in society and those yes. in need. Yes. He regularly yes. taught his followers that we should be on the lookout for people in need. So yes. what is your level of concern for those who are disadvantaged and in need? Are you currently doing anything to help those who are disadvantaged? Like, for example, are you in any kind of regular rhythm of where you go out and you serve some area in the community or you, you look out for a certain neighbor, like you're in a rhythm where you check in on that person or that group of people? And then finally, how could you change your life around so that you can make a bigger impact on the people around you? How could you change your life around? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for saving us and letting us be part of your family. Lord, teach us what your mission is about and how we can carry out your mission. Let your Holy Spirit open our eyes to reveal what we need to see today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a regular theme in both the Old Testament and the New Testament was these people who claimed to be religious, right? If it was under the Old Testament, Judaism, you know, I'm a Jewish person, I'm an Israelite. They claim to be an Israelite and religious uh, New Testament, they claimed to be a follower of Jesus, um, but they weren't doing anything to help those in need. This was a frequent theme all throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament. And God would address this, and Jesus, when he came to earth, he addressed this, of course, directly by being there in person. Um, and this was definitely true of the Pharisees in Jesus' day. Okay, the Pharisees, they knew the scriptures very well because they studied the scriptures all the time, but they were not putting the scriptures into practice. How many of you know there's a difference between knowing the scriptures and putting them into practice? You can know the word. You can know. They knew God's word, but they didn't know the heart of God. 
You can know God's word and not know the heart of God. And who does he love? And who does he care about? And who does he want us then reaching out to? Um, and so Jesus comes in to show them how they should live through his words and his example. His example. So we've already talked about in previous lessons where the Pharisees had this problem called legalism. You remember that lesson? It was a few lessons back. They, they would almost even add rules to the Bible and make it even harder yes. than the yes. word actually says, right? They would be so nitpicky about certain things, they would make it harder to follow God's word. Uh, and the best example is how they interpreted not doing work on the Sabbath. <laughs> this was one of their really bad areas. So get this. They interpreted that if the lights were on when the Sabbath came, Remember, Sabbath starts at sundown. If the lights were on and you hadn't blown out the candles yet, you had to leave them on. If there were candles or lights that you wanted lit, but you hadn't lit them before Sabbath, it was too late. You had to wait till after the Sabbath because lighting the candles would be work. The rabbis had concluded that giving medical attention to people on the Sabbath was doing work. And so you couldn't help someone. So, for example, if you broke a bone, the doctor on the Sabbath, the doctor couldn't reset the bone until after the Sabbath was over. You just had to deal with your broken arm. Um, you could not bathe. Uh, this this one's funny. You could not bathe for fear that when the water fell off of you, it might wash the floor, and that's doing work, washing the floor. So you can't bathe on the Sabbath. They had some stinky folks on the Sabbath, apparently. <laughs> And then this one is hilarious to me. They taught you should not look in the mirror. Some, some of you ladies will appreciate this. Uh, I mean, I do this too, but they told you you should not look in the mirror because if you see a gray hair, you might be tempted to pluck out the gray hair, and that's considered a reaping. And, and so you can't, don't look in the mirror. Yeah. Whatever. So the Pharisees... The Pharisees might have been good at not working on the Sabbath, but they had lost sight of the things that were most important to God. Also, the Pharisees became so consumed with keeping the law, their version of it, that they had lost sight of the original intent of that law. For example, on the, the Sabbath, it was meant to be a day of what? Rest, right? Uh, just God, you know, just as God rested on the seventh day from creating the world, he wants us humans to take a day of rest, right? But they had turned it into this, well, don't even pluck a, a gray hair out, right? Like they had taken it to the extreme. Yeah. Just just rest. That's the That was the original point. And remembrance. And so God has always wanted his people, God's people, to gather together and remember what God has done for us. And that's what we did just a minute ago, right, when we took communion. We took communion as a body of believers, as a group of God's people, and remembered what Jesus had done for us. So let's read Matthew chapter 12 together. But before we read this passage, uh, let's talk about some things that would be good to know about this story. All right, Jesus is going to reference uh, a story from the Old Testament in the section of the Bible where David, before he was King David, um, was, was on the run from King Saul. Saul was jealous of David, and so he chased him all around. David's having to go from place to place and hide from Saul. And in one of these towns he came across, he comes across a Jewish priest, and he says, hey, is there any food to eat? I'm, I'm on the run, I need some food. The priest says, well, the only food there is is the consecrated bread in the tabernacle, which only the priest is supposed to eat. Um, and, and so David actually says, well, go ahead and give me the bread. We, we need some food. We're, we're hungry. All right. Uh, when Jesus uses the term son of man, he's speaking about himself. Uh, it's a reference to himself. And he also when he's speaking, he's speaking of himself when he says, one greater than the temple is here. And then finally, remember the definition of mercy. The biblical definition of mercy is kindness or compassion that leads to action. Right? To have mercy, to show mercy to someone means to help them in need. Okay? So, Matthew 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry and began to pick some heads of grain and eat them. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath. In other words, they thought they're doing work. They're working. He answered, Haven't you read 
I love Jesus' answers. <laughs> Haven't you read what David did? They knew David. They knew the scripture, the story. When he and his companions were hungry, he entered the house of God, and he and his companions ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for them to do, but only for the priests. Or haven't you read in the law that the priests on Sabbath duty in the temple desecrate the Sabbath and yet are innocent? I tell you that something greater than the temple is here. Amen. If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, kindness that leads to action, compassion that leads to action, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? They're trying to trick him, trap him. He said to them, again, I love Jesus. He gives a very common sense answer. Guys, if any of you has a sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Amen. Then he said to him, the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. He did a miracle. But the Pharisees went out and plotted how they might kill Jesus. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> they were so stuck on this whole, we don't do work on the Sabbath. They couldn't accept the miracles that were being done right in front of their face. And they wanted to kill this man. Jesus. So what do we learn from this? Sheep are valuable. If you were a shepherd and you had a flock of sheep that you cared for, uh, would you care if one of them fell in a ditch? Yes. Would you just leave them there and be like, oh, I'd well, love to help you, but it's the Sabbath. <laughs> um, and then what does Jesus say? How much more valuable are people than sheep? And we are. Humans are more valuable uh, not that God doesn't care about the animals, he cares about animals, but we humans are made in God's likeness. And so we are more valuable in his eyes. And so he's like, do good on the Sabbath. It's okay to do good. The Pharisees, sadly, cared more about keeping rules than caring about people. But Jesus showed consistently, time and time again, that he put people above rules every single time. If he's got to choose between people and helping them or rules, he chose people. So the Pharisees were upset because according to them, the disciples by plucking these heads of grain and eating them were doing work. I wish I was making this up, but I'm not. The Pharisees, according to them, plucking wheat from its stem is reaping. Rubbing the wheat heads between one's palms is threshing. <laughs> and blowing away the chaff is winnowing. Okay, Pharisees. <laughs> Would you see that, say the Pharisees were being legalistic in applying the law? I mean, this is going too far. Would you really say the disciples were guilty of working on the Sabbath? I don't think so, right? So the Pharisees didn't like Jesus because he didn't follow the law about the Sabbath. To them, not working on the Sabbath meant not giving medical attention. As I said earlier, if you broke a bone on the Sabbath, you had to wait till after, right? And well, here he is. He's healing on the Sabbath. He's working. He's doing the work of a doctor, and he's giving medical attention. And Jesus had to remind them of their misunderstanding of God's intentions when he laid down the Sabbath law. Um, Jesus points out that sometimes it's okay to make exceptions to the rule. Now, you don't want to be doing this all the time. That's why it's called an exception, right? But sometimes in our lives, things are going to happen where we're going to say, you know what? Normally, I would do this, but in this case, it's a special case. I'm going to make an exception, right? Like, have you ever made a hard and fast rule that you kept pretty regularly in your life, but then something special happened and you said, I'm going to put that aside for right now? Um, do we have any uh, super rule keepers in here? So what I mean by that is there's certain personalities. Um, I like personality tests, and there's one called the DISC. It's D-I-S-C. And if you're in the C quadrant, you are a rule keeper. You really like the rules, and you get upset when people don't keep the rules. Um, 
And so some of you may have somebody like that in your family. Like you're playing a board game. This has happened in our family. We're playing a board game and we have a wide range of kids, right? We have a seven-year-old right now. And sometimes he's not old enough to understand all the rules of the game, right? So we're playing a game and all of a sudden he makes a bad move. And we go, oh, buddy, you, you don't want to do that. You, that's really going to hurt you in this game, right? Tell you what, you can take that back. You can take that move back. And we'll let you go again. And the rule keeper in the family will be like, oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you can't do that. The rules say, the rules say. Right? They might have rule keepers in their family like that. <laughs> you, those rule keepers would have fit very well. I see some elbows and some elbows. Yeah, that's you. Uh, you would have fit very well in with the Pharisees. <laughs> that, that would have been a new group. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. Kidding. Uh, but they were. They were rule keepers. Wow. Uh, but here's the question. Do you care more about rules than people? Because if you do, we need to switch that. Amen. Right? Jesus taught we need to switch that. Isaiah 58. Let's turn to Isaiah 58. Um, and I'll give you time to turn there. I cheated. I had a bookmark. But, uh, Isaiah 58, uh, which is page 638, if you're using these Bibles. Um, Isaiah 58. Okay, Isaiah was a prophet. God used prophets as his mouthpiece, right? If God needed a message to get out to the people, he used the prophets. And so he sent Isaiah and he gave them very specific messages, right? God is going to speak through the, the prophet Isaiah. He's got a very specific message to the Israelites. Um, this is 700 years before Jesus. Um, these people, again, these people who claim to be religious, but they're not helping people, right? This theme that we talked about. Verse 1, shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? This is the Israelites talking to God. Why have we fasted, they say, and God, you haven't seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, God is speaking back through Isaiah, on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on high. Yeah. Uh, ouch. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen, says God, to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? <clears throat> when you see the naked, to clothe them and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. <clears throat> then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here am I. Here am I. All right, so we see this term injustice, and it's really hard in modern days to not put our modern definitions onto things that were written years ago, right? Seven, you know, 2,700 years ago. Let me tell you what justice back then meant, okay? To act justly, we see this phrase here in Isaiah 58, also in Micah 6, 8. To act justly means to do what is right, specifically to do right by people, to do right by people. The opposite of justice, injustice, is corruption, to do wrong, to mistreat people, to do people wrong, okay? Does everybody get that? So that's the definition we're using. The Israelites at this time would say, why is it that when we fast and pray and ask God for things, God doesn't seem to answer? 
And God's like, hmm, let's see. You exploit workers, which means you take advantage of workers for your own benefit. Uh, you get into fights with each other. You're not doing right by people. You're accepting bribes. You're, you're robbing people. You have dishonest scales. You're, you're doing false witness in court. Right? You don't share your food with the hungry. You don't provide wanderers with shelter. You don't give clothes to those who need him. And so God says, you're not doing right by God, and you're not doing right by people. Why would I answer your prayers? Why would I answer your prayer? You're not doing right by God. You're not doing right by people. And, and uh, it's such a relevant message for today. Um, you know, people say, I pray, I pray, but God doesn't answer. Well, you know, here's the hard question. Are, are you doing right by people? Are you doing right by God? Um, and, but here's the good news. Did you notice the good news in there, in that message that Isaiah gave was, if they would change and they would start to do right by God and by people, he said, then I will hear. Then your healing will appear. Then when you call on me, I will answer and say, here am I. So we can change. We can change and do right. And God will hear our prayers. Same message in, in Micah 6, 8. Micah 6, 8 just really is a great summary verse. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. How many of you have heard that verse before? pretty famous verse. What does it mean? Do right by people. Love to show kindness. Right? Love to show kindness and help other people and walk humbly with your God. So question, do you love to show kindness? Do you love, is it in your heart to help those in need and those who are disadvantaged? Or do you need to pray and ask God, Lord, change my heart? so that I do care for these people and develop this kind of heart for others. God is looking for people who love to help others. Jesus, while he was on earth, all his ministry was focused on helping others, helping those in need, right? And if we are his disciples, which another word for disciple is apprentice, if we are apprenticing to learn from Jesus, his followers should care about the disadvantaged and those in need as well. That's right. I love the story of uh, a guy named Dan Rodriguez. Uh, the Rodriguez family was homeless. And uh, they were out in California, and they, they uh, happened to come across this Christian family who decided to take their whole family, the whole Rodriguez family, uh, mother, kids, and all. Uh, and one day, the family who took them in invited them to go to church with them. Now, they weren't church goers, but because they thought, well, these people have taken us into their homes when we were homeless, it's only right that we go to church with them, right? And so they did. They were the only Hispanics in the entire church. But people loved them. The, pe the people of the church loved them well, showed they cared about them. Uh, fast forward, the mother gets baptized. Eventually the kids are baptized. Today, the Rodriguez kids, out of all the Rodriguez kids, one is a professor of Bible at Pepperdine University, and all the other kids are missionaries. Oh, See, that's that's what showing love of God can do, right? Isn't that isn't that amazing? Yes. Um, my son Josiah, uh, we were we were going, uh, we made a quick trip down to Nashville, and if you've ever driven between here and Nashville, you know there's a giant dinosaur on the side of the road. And every time we go past it, I point the dinosaur out. It's a place called Dinosaur World. And I go, look, buddy, there's the dinosaur. There's the dinosaur. He's, oh, cool, cool. Well, this time on the way back, I go, hey, there's the dinosaur again. And he goes, Daddy, can, I, can we go? And I was like, oh, well, I wasn't thinking that, you know. But uh, I was like, you know what? We've never gone. Let's stop and see the price. You know, we'll just see the prices. So we, I went in, saw the prices. I told her to Andrea, she said, why don't you just take Josiah in? The older kids don't really seem interested. Just you and Josiah. So we did. I think Dinosaur World should be renamed Upcharge World. <laughs> because they have figured out like 10 ways to get more money out of you as soon as you walk through those doors. We come to this area that's like, you can be a gold miner, but it's gems. It's these gems. And they're like, and, and so Josiah runs to Daddy, I want to do this. 
I, and so I take them in and they go, oh, sir, you have to pay for that if you want to do this area. I'm like, really? Really, people? Come on. I said, how much? And they said, well, it's $9 for the small bag, $11 for the big bag. And I said, well, if I'm going to pay 9 I might as well pay 11 or pay two more dollars to get the big bag. They know what they're doing. They're not stupid. Okay. So they got me on the big bag. So you, it has that, that water, you know, like, like a gold miner, there's water coming through, and you put it in a little basket and you shake the basket, right? So he's, he puts this lump of dirt in there and starts putting the water, shaking the basket, and out come these, these gems. I know you probably can't see them very well. Uh, so that was on a Saturday. Uh, and Dinosaur World's pretty cool. I, I give it a four out of five stars. But, um, but anyway, fast forward, so that was Saturday. Sunday night, we have a night youth for our nine to 17 year olds. We're down in the basement, we're eating supper, and all of a sudden I see all these kids that have these little gems in front of them. And I go, Josiah, did you bring your gems in? And he goes, yeah. I'm giving them out to people. And I said, well, stop doing that. I said, I spent good money on those gems. $11, man. I was like, I spent good money on quit giving them away. I mean, this bag was full. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, fast forward. So that was Sunday night, youth, right? Fast forward to Thursday. I'm writing my message that I'm giving you today, studying about helping people in need and caring about others. And I was convicted and it hit me like, Jeremy, what were you doing? Getting on to your son for sharing gems that he had. Like, you know, I was like, duh, stupid. Like, you should be congratulating him, you know? Our whole heart is God wants us to be generous like him, right? And I scolded him. So I went back and I said, hey, buddy, that was a good thing you did. Keep sharing, keep being it. But, but am I, is it just me? Like, I feel my selfish nature like rise up in me, and it's like we want to hold on to stuff. We want to be oh, selfish. Yes, like, no, yes. don't give that away. I spent good money on that, right? Yes. You know. But God, God's heart is to help others and be generous yes. and share. Yes. And, and so I, yes. I had to repent. I say, God, work on my heart, change my heart, yes. help me to be more generous. I'm so sorry. That was silly. That was stupid. You know, help me, help me. Um, so we have uh, what we call next steps. Uh, at impact where based on the lesson that we you're hearing you can take decide to take these next steps there's four of them you can do one of them or all of them doesn't matter uh, if you're a really go-getter do all four but um, <laughs> the first one is sign up for serving at market at heart food pantry uh, I have served there they are great people you won't find a better group of people that run that place um, and they, they are technically a Christian organization, although I, I don't think they can come right out and say it. I don't know. But they do have a prayer. Uh, if you go there in the morning, they circle everybody up and have a prayer before, uh, only on the morning shift. But uh, they do pray at the beginning of their day. The second one is become a Lions Club member. So I'm a member of the Re Reynoldsburg Lions Club. And if you're looking for more ways to get out there and serve people, this group will give you plenty of opportunities throughout the year. They really will. Um, and you don't have to do all of them, you know. Not everybody's at all the things. But you can pick which ones you want to be at. But they have one that's really near and dear to my heart. It's called Care for the Cold. It's in January, near the beginning of the new year. They go down to a laundromat off of Parsons, and they give out hats and gloves and oh, coats okay. and socks and food. And I'll tell you what, everyone who does that comes away feeling good. I mean, every single person like, wow, that was so good that we did that. Um, and you feel, you really feel like you bless people. Um, so become a Lions Club member. If you're, if you're like, God's nudging you, yeah, I do need to get out and serve more. They'll give you the opportunities. Ask me. You know, we have some other Lions members in here. Ask them uh, if you want to learn how to become a member. Um, we do a lot of good stuff. Uh, one one group, or actually two uh, two groups of people that God especially wants us to look after in the Old and New Testament is orphans and widows. So Isaiah 117 says, learn to do right, seek justice, defend the oppressed, take up the cause of the fatherless, that's orphans, and plead the case of the widow. Orphans and widows, same thing in James, orphans and widows, right? Orphans and widows are typically, not always, but typically poor, sometimes naive, and get taken advantage of. They're a group that can be taken advantage of. 
And God doesn't like that when people are taken advantage of. And so he needs people to stand up for these, you know, for the orphans. Um, th this, this was interesting in my studies. In Isaiah's time when he wrote this, the fatherless and the widows could not even get a hearing in court because they didn't have enough money to bribe the rulers. Isn't that sad? Yes. Like they couldn't even get a fair hearing unless you had money to bribe. Um, the elderly are often taken advantage of because sometimes they lose their mental faculties yeah. and they have sales calls and people trying to take advantage and sell them things they don't really need and, and get them to, you know, to steal their money. And, and you probably have seen that in, yeah. in people you know in their life. Like, you know, people trying to take advantage of the elderly. I, I, I just, I'm scared for those people because God says not cool. If you're, if you're taking advantage of elderly or little children, not cool, right? And and please change your ways. Um, but the elderly could use an advocate. You know, they need someone to come alongside them and help them not be taken advantage of. And that's us. That's what God's calling us to do. He's calling us to care about the disadvantaged and become an advocate for them. Become someone who looks out for their best interests, right? Uh, human trafficking. Uh, I didn't know this. Uh, but when I moved to Columbus, I found out a couple years in that apparently Columbus is a hub and is a really bad spot for human yeah. trafficking. And the reason is because we have two major highways, 70 and 71, where a person can steal a child and quickly get far away through one of the major highways. Very sad. But I, I have the utmost respect for those who are trying to do something about human trafficking. And there are groups out there uh, feeding hungry children. You know, God cares about that, and there's, there's lots of ways to get involved in that. Guys, listen, it's easy to point at rich, fat cats and blame them for everything that's wrong or for injustice, but what are we trying to do? What are we trying to do to help people in need? Let's not just sit back and play the blame game. Let's try to make a difference. Let's get in there and get our hands dirty yeah. uh, and, and help. Um, so who, who could we adopt as a group? Who could we adopt? Uh, I want us. I want us as a church to be thinking about this. Who is there a person, a group of people that we could really focus in on and say we are going to do something about this? Because we can't do everything, right? We can't do everything, uh, but we can do something. And so, who could we focus in on? Uh, I've been to a couple of concerts recently, Christian concerts, where um, they brought out the Compassion International and the helping kids in other in, in other countries. And for like $30 a month, you can feed a kid and they get schooling. And $30 a month, that's really not much, you know? You can feed a child for $30 a month. And it reminded me, maybe uh, we used to do this at another church we were at. Our youth actually supported a kid from Haiti. Uh, we actually took up a collection among the youth. It's $30 a month. You know, can we as a group of teenagers collect $30 a month? I think we can, you know? And, yeah. You know, me and Andre yeah. pitched in to cover what, what we didn't get, you know, but, uh, but, but it worked. It was cool. The kids had their adopted kid, and the kid would write letters back and forth. And, uh, I said, we need to get this going uh, here at our church to teach kids. Kids need to learn. Kids can support kids. That's what they were talking about. The speakers who spoke about it, they're like, the coolest thing is when our kids bought into this vision, and they started working, and they started supporting kids out of their pocket all out of their own thing, you know? Um, so our, our last two next steps are adopt adopt a child, uh, feed the hungry, and then befriend an elderly family member or a neighbor and look out for them. Like I said, you know, that, that'd be a good thing to do, right? Just, just come alongside someone and say, hey, I'm really gonna keep in touch with this neighbor of mine or this person in my life and just make sure that, that they're not being taken advantage of. So like I said, you do one or all those you just check that and make it as a goal. Uh, and then I did think of one last one that didn't get into the, uh, the next steps. Uh, my parents used to do this. For those who might not be physically able to, say, stand at a food pantry for three hours, um, if you need to be sitting and doing something, my parents used to work with something called Crossroad Prison Ministries, where they sent correspondence lessons out to prison inmates, <laughs> and then the, the inmates would do the lesson, and it would get sent back, and my parents would grade the test and then send it back to them. And, you know, you can do that sitting down. You, anyone can do that, right? Um, and my dad actually still has a relationship with a guy who's, this year is his parole. He's been uh, keeping in touch with this guy for, like, what, seven years? And this is, and he's, he's hoping this will be the year that he gets out. But 
how cool is that? You know, to actually keep up with someone for that long. So lots, lots of things we can do, guys. Lots, there's lots of ways we can get involved. Pick one, right? Mother Teresa said, uh, if you can't feed a hundred people, feed one. Feed one. Feed one. Nobody can do everything, but all can do something, something. right? Amen. This is following in the footsteps of our Lord, of our Master, Jesus, of our Rabbi, uh, caring for this advantage. So let's, let's pray. Father God, thank you for calling us your children. Thank you for forgiving of us of our sins and, and making us right with you, God. As your children, we ask that, we, that you help us become more like you. Help us to be like Jesus and develop a heart for serving others. Change our hearts and help us to be more compassionate like you. God, as we have made the goal today to help those who are disadvantaged and in need, please let your Holy Spirit guide us. Help us to follow through with this. Sometimes it's easy to get inspired by a message one day and then it quickly falls off. But God, I pray that you would inspire us and that this would become a lifestyle, a habit in our lives of looking out for others and being your hands and feet, Jesus. We want to help you in your work of mending the brokenness in our world. Amen. So God, open our eyes to see. Yes, God, it's so easy to just go about our daily lives and miss everything yes, around us, yes. miss all the people around us that yes, we can Lord. be reaching out to. God, open our eyes. Yes. Help us to see those that you are trying yes. to point us to. And God, help us to just do what we can. Do. Just do what we can. To show the hope of Jesus uh, to others. Lord, uh, I just pray that you will convict us yes, this morning Lord. in a good way. Uh, convict us deep down in our hearts to be like yes, Jesus Lord. in this way. In your name we pray. Jesus. Amen.